uh, this month. One today, and we have another one uh, that will be announced uh, later this week. Um, that's on the 30th, we have another talk as well. Um, that's on the Bangladeshi um, factory disaster. Um, we have a, a, an expert who, who happens to be in town um, and they'll be talking about that. We'll send that out um, to, tomorrow, right? right? Tomorrow. Or Monday. <laughs> okay. Um, but uh, this month, um, we're very honored to have Sumil here. Um, Sumil's been a, a, a regular participant in our, in our group for, for quite a while now, for the past, for the past year. Um, and uh, I think it's high time we, we got to know him a little bit better and, 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 and uh, find out what, uh, uh, what he's been up to and how, how we can all participate. Um, uh, a quick intro, Sunil Shah is a Marketing Development Director for Thailand, Myanmar, and Laos for GE. He spent much of his time in this role supporting renewable energy products projects in Thailand as well as other clean technology initiatives as part of, part of GE's eco-imagination eco <laughs> eco portfolio. <laughs> so we also pursue his passion as an environmentalist um, and entrepreneur by founding Enagaya. He's conducted extensive research, developed a new Argi um, bioreactor system, patent pending, built a pilot project site, and assembled a top-notch local team of microbiologists carbon experts, food and beverage industry leaders, and socially minded individuals to support the company's goals and objectives. Um, Sunil graduated from uh, Georgia Institute of Technology in Atlanta, Georgia. He holds both bachelor's and master's in aerospace engineering. So without further ado, a warm welcome to Sunil. Thank you. 
orders and stopping production. So I moved back here in uh, late 2008, started uh, doing some more R&D in earnest, and continued working. We started to uh, hire some people. We started an R&D facility in Utia. We started building a pilot site at a rice mill in Utia. And then in uh, November, October, November 2011, as many of you remember uh, who were here, we had some serious water issues in Thailand. And our project site in the Utah, as well as most of the UTA, was about three meters underwater. That took us about nine months or more to recover from. So we learned some valuable lessons. We moved our R&D center and some production back to Bangkok. And I rejoined GE in January 2012 because they had some needs and I had stayed in touch with the local office here and also it permitted me to recover financially a bit and continue to fund my, my passion. Because one thing is when you are a tech R&D startup in a non-US kind of environment, a place where you don't have large-scale venture capital, uh, you, you end up having to bootstrap a bit longer than, than others, right? And so we continue to bootstrap it, but we're quite excited with our progress and uh, we're scaling up production right now. We're actually selling product. And, and I've got some spiralina here today from our production that uh, we'll get to try a little bit later. So, so let's start. Um, one of the main things that we encounter is a real uh, kind of a lack of awareness of it about what spirulina is. It's not well known. So um, I'm going to start my talk by discussing, and I'm really going to focus on kind of you know what is spirulina, how is it produced, what are we doing, and, and uh, you know then we can have a Q and A session, right? So show of hands. How many people are familiar with what spirulina is? Okay, that's you know actually a higher percentage than in most of the populace, right? Probably because you guys were interested in this talk, right? So the sample set is is a, is a little bit skewed. Most people don't know what it is, and it's okay. Spirulina um, is actually this was working right. Really. Um, 
So spirulina was kind of first actually recorded as being discovered by the Aztecs. Um, where Mexico City is now, there used to be a large lake. And spirulina grows naturally. It's a freshwater microbe. So nowadays it grows in, in freshwater. It needs a high alkaline environment. So it grows in high pH, right? Very basic water, pH 8 to 10. So there's a few lakes around the world. One is Lake Chad. One is the lake where Mexico City uh, resides now. They filled in that lake to expand the city, so it's not really there anymore. Um, there's uh, one in China, one in Myanmar, a few others around the world. And in those types of lakes and environments, spirulina again grows naturally. Um, so first, some of the first reported <coughs> consumers of spirulina were the ancient Aztecs who lived around Mexico City. And they would mix it with chocolate but not the sweet chocolate that we have now, the initial chocolate that they produced was the bitter kind. And they mix it and it was considered to be a very healthy kind of food for the gods and so the leaders of the Aztecs would consume it predominantly. Um, so, why did they, and this is a picture of what it looks like. It's called spirulina because of its spiral structure. It's a kind of a long spiral cell and it can be 30 to 50 microns in size when you when you have it like this, which makes it quite easy to deal with, quite easy to harvest. So, why do they consider it to be a food of the gods, and why do some people these days consider it to be a superfood, right, if you believe in that type of terminology, or just in general a very healthy food? And by some people, I mean, you know, accredited organizations. NASA considers spirulina to be, you know, basically what most think will be the principal source of food for astronauts if they go on deep space missions. Because, as we're going to show you, it grows in a very, in a very compact space. You can produce quite a lot of it. It's a fairly complete food from a nutritional perspective. It's high in protein, high in vitamins, high in minerals. Um, and so it's very sustaining. You don't need a whole lot else. You can consume uh, spirulina. Um, and you know, as a as a single cell plant, it gives up oxygen and uptakes CO2. So it's good for a kind of a long distance confined space journey, for example. So you've got NASA on the one side, right? Which is kind of the fun, futuristic. You know, I just saw Star Trek last night kind of, of, of atmosphere, right? And then, you know, on the other side, you've got the World Health Organization and the Food and Agricultural Organization of the UN and some NGOs out of Switzerland, such as uh, Antenna Technologies, who utilize spirulina, and I'll show you a system uh, of what they, what they do, in um, kind of very <coughs> rural, poor environments to combat malnutrition in places like Sub-Saharan Africa and India. So they have the small villages, grow spirulina, and feed it to children, etc. And so some of the reasons why, and I don't want to read to you, but it's, you know, you can read it here as I speak, it's, it's a very complete protein source. It's got all the essential amino acids, high in, uh, as I mentioned, certain minerals, vitamins. Um, it's one of only two or three natural sources of GLA, another being human breast milk. Um, and one of the main things as well that it's used in some medical applications, such as uh, nutrition for patients who are uh, on radiation and chemotherapy, for example, um, is because it's very easy to digest. It has doesn't have a hard cellulosic cell wall like normal plants do. You know, it doesn't have a lot of fiber or anything like that. It's got its cell wall is a kind of a simple sugar-based cell wall. So most foods that we consume, you you eat it, it goes into the stomach. The stomach is a highly acidic environment. And by the way, anybody who believes in these uh, alkaline water machines and stuff. It doesn't really work scientifically, right? Because your stomach is acidic. You have a bladder that injects more acid if you put a basic thing into your system. So it just shifts the pH back to where it needs to be for you to actually be able to break down food. So don't get poked by some pokey who wants to sell you a $2,000 alkaline water generator. That's that's a complete scam. Okay. So anyway, uh, your stomach acid is about pH two to four. You it breaks down your food. And then normally to complete the digestion process, the food travels to your intestines, right? Your small intestine in particular helps with digestion. Uh, large intestines mostly then for food processing and waste extraction, right? So spirulina, because of its uh, simple sugar cell wall, actually can digest and pass into your system through the stomach lining. 
It doesn't even have to make its way into the intestines. It's very easy to digest, and therefore it's very good for people who are having trouble keeping food down and things like this. They can consume some spirulina and get a lot of nutritional value without the risk of giving it back up. Right? And in fact, uh, a lot of places like Sub-Saharan Africa where they use it, they about malnutrition. They just take spirulina in raw form and mix it in with water and give it to people to drink. You don't need to mix it in with anything else. You can for taste, but you don't have to. Okay, so um, this is what it looks like uh, as a paste. Um, so what happens is, I'll show you later, we grow it in water, and it just looks like green water, just like if you're out in a lake or something like this with algae growing in it. You know, you sift your hand through it, you can't really tell, but the base color is green. What we do is we use uh, kind of filters, thaw filters, to then harvest a lot of wet paste out of our system. And then we process it into kind of a drier paste like this. And we sell this as jars. We're one of the only companies in the world doing that. We've been able to get the shelf life naturally up to about three to four weeks. There's a lot of folks who buy from us here in Bangkok because we produce in an urban environment. Urban farmers, as I'll show you. Or uh, most places in the world dry it into a powder. And they either sell it as a powder or they turn it into vitamin tablets and sell it as a nutraceutical. Uh, some cases like to say that this looks like the Incredible Hulk's uh, poo, but uh, it doesn't quite look like that when you see it. Um, if you have like a, we sell a 100 gram and a 300 gram jar, so if you have 300 grams of fresh fire lean in a week, then these are the types of nutritional, uh, or these are the types of nutrients that you get. And what does that mean? So we recommend for our fresh paste, because just like all fresh foods, there's there's water in a fresh product, right? There's a, there's a fair amount of water. Like if you eat salmon, it's 60 to 70 percent water. If you eat spinach, a whole lot of water. You know, that's just, just like our bodies, right? We're 70 plus percent water. So if you eat a fresh product, there's water. Um, if you eat dry powder, you need a smaller sample size. For a fresh product, we recommend a 30 to 40 gram serving size. Dry product, they say 3 to 10 grams serving size. Um, so if you consume 300 grams of fresh spirulina in a week, what is that like? That's the equivalent of getting uh, as much zinc as 71 grams of spinach, as much calcium as 116 grams of tofu, as much magnesium as 200 grams of, uh, 210 grams of banana, and as, much, as much protein as 216 grams of beef, and as much iron as 170 grams of beef liver, all in one. Right? You don't need to, to eat all of these things. And what we found, uh, and, and this is unsolicited feedback from people who take it, is it's very filling. Depending on your caloric requirements, it's, it's not high in calories. Like a 100 gram jar of our paste is only about 20 calories. It's almost negligible in fat, because it's about 6% of uh, lipids. 6% of the content, which is fatty oils and acids. And the uh, fatty acids are, are good, omega-6s and omega-3s, but it's a small percentage because it's mostly protein. So it's low in calories, but because it's high in protein and everything else, it's, it's quite filling. So if you make a smoothie or something with it in the morning, then you tend to be able to have a smaller lunch, maybe skip your morning snack, or if you, you know, have a lower caloric requirement, like kind of our parents' generation, we have a lot of parents who so they don't need to eat much. They just get hungry around, naturally around 4 or 5 instead of 12 or 1. So it just depends, right? It's a pretty complete food in that sense. So, you know, we, we prefer to provide it in fresh form. And, and this is not a plug. I'm just kind of giving you uh, an idea of, of what, what, we, what we're selling. Because, um, you know, it's, it's just easier to cook with and it's easier to, to add to any meal. So you can just mix it, get, mix it in with regular foods, right? And what I want to do is, uh, is actually give you guys a sample as I continue to talk here. Um, so what's the environmental impact of our spirulina production, right? The positive environmental impact. It's like pretty much any plant, right? Um, it's a CO2 consumer. So you know, it takes about two, two grams or two kilos or whatever measurement. It's a two to one ratio. So for about two kilos of carbon going to producing one kilo of, you know, basically pure biomass of spirulina, right? Um, so that's, that's one positive benefit because you're uptaking carbon dioxide when you grow it, right? 
we are. But if you think about it from a carbon footprint perspective, because it's so high in protein, what happens is we find a lot of folks, you know, we're not touting that everybody become vegetarian. I mean, that's, that's difficult for most, right? Um, I, I myself freely confess I'm not a vegetarian, right? I have a lot of family that are. As you can see, I'm of Indian descent, right? So I have a lot of family who are. But I myself, born and raised in the US, I'm not. So, uh, but if, from an environmental perspective, we believe uh, a reasonable impact over, spread out over a lot of people is a big impact. If we can get a large number of people to start consuming some spirulina in the morning and they reduce their total meat uptake naturally, right? You won't have to do it consciously because you're just getting enough protein anyway. You reduce, uh, carnivore reduces their, or omnivore rather, reduces their normal meat intake by 10%. That 10% spread out over a lot of people will have a massive impact, right? From a sustainability perspective. Because the carbon footprint, uh, carbon footprint of the meat industry, as well as the water footprint and everything else is, is quite, uh, quite bad, right? Very, very bad. It takes a lot of carbon, it takes a lot of water. You know, for like one kilo of beef, it takes about 15,000 liters of water. You know? It's incredible, right? It's really incredible. So, you know, just uh, looking at it from that perspective, right? When you take something that's carbon negative and you use it to replace something that's incredibly carbon positive, right, from a footprint perspective, that's, that can be quite impactful. Okay, um, so as I mentioned, spirulina, because of how I'm going to show you its density and everything else, it requires less water than any other any terrestrial crop. It takes a lot less energy to produce and far less land. And I'll give you some figures about that as well. So, so let's talk about spirulina production. And now we have to show you some fun pictures, right? Um, as I mentioned, one of the reasons we're here in Thailand, right, is because spirulina, to grow the fastest, right, it, it, spirulina can grow in an environment from as little as 15 degrees Celsius to as high as 40, low 40s degrees Celsius, right? But for it to grow optimally, the peak in its growth curve is around 32 to 38 degrees Celsius, you know, or maybe even a little bit broader, 30 to 39. Well, if you look at tropical climates like Thailand, you've pretty much got this temperature almost all year round, right? So it's very ideal for continuous production of spirulina, for example, right? Now, as I mentioned, today in the world, um, most production is only done in natural lakes or open ponds, man-made ponds. We call them raceway ponds. And I'll show you some pictures of that. But we have our own method that I'm going to show you as well. And let's talk a little bit about spirulina and how fast it grows, right? Before I, I get into this a little bit. Um, so just, first of all, total worldwide algae production today is, depending upon whose figures you believe, it's only between 20,000 and 60,000 tons per year. And the reason why I gave that caveat is half of it is produced, you know, this is FAO reports and everything else, half of it is reported to be produced in China, but it's not fully auditable, right? It's pretty much not auditable at all. So if you think that, you know, China's producing on the high end of that figure, and this is all algae, not just spirulina, right? Then um, it's, you know, 60,000 tons. If you think maybe the low end of their reports, there's 20,000 tons. Sounds like a lot. Um, but in actuality, if you think about global food production, you know, it scratches the surface, right? This is predominantly used as a nutraceutical product, so vitamin tablets, um, sold because of its high nutritious value. Uh, catering for its people like pregnant women, it's very good for fetal development, or uh, as a nutritional su supplement for vegetarians, things like this. Um, or it's sold, uh, kind of a lower grade of it, is sold into the animal feed industry. Um, and different levels of, of animal feed as well, because the beta carotene in spirulina is known to bring out and induce this very strong orange pigment in things like uh, koi fish. So it's used in high end aquarium feeds. Um, it's also been, uh, like in Asia, I think uh, you, you might notice compared to the US, for example, egg yolks tend to be a bit more orange here than they are in the West, where they tend to be a bit more yellow. Part of that is consumer, kind of what the consumers are used to. So now in chicken farms, 
the way to make egg yolks are just to feed a little bit of beta carotene to the chickens, right? And uh, or hens, I guess, were the ones laying the eggs. And and so that's done here more than it's done in the West because we are more used to a yellow yolk, right? So uh, spirulina is one source of beta carotene that's fed in chicken feed in some cases, but it tends to be a bit too expensive to do on a large scale. Um, so uh, global production is that level. And why is that, right? The reason why is because with these production methods, you only are permitted to have small scale production and it's expensive. It's either land intensive or it takes a lot of time and effort to produce it. And we're trying to change the game. We want to turn spirulina, and we have a 10 to 20 year plan. We want spirulina to eventually be a healthier form of spinach. And maybe 50, 60 years ago, spinach wasn't consumed very much, right? Popeye kind of brought out a spinach boom, right? Because everybody thought, oh, you know, you can get strong muscles from the calcium and other things and the iron in spinach, right? The spinach is a good food, don't get me wrong. But if spinach is, is you know, going to power Popeye, then spirulina can power the Incredible Hulk, right? And it's just a lot better for you. So we want, eventually, if we can kind of bring the awareness levels up amongst the consumer base, we want to drop the price of spirulina, which is we set our price kind of in line with mainstream foods, not with nutraceuticals. We want to encourage people to take it and use it, try it, and raise awareness so that eventually you find it in your grocery store and people buy it every week or whatever with their other groceries and consume it regularly, and it becomes your, your spinach. So how would we do that? Well, today, as I mentioned, places like the World Health Organization and Food and Agricultural Organization that uh, try to utilize spirulina to combat malnutrition in, in uh, rural, highly rural, poor environments, they make these little artificial ponds, right? This is one way of, of trying to grow spirulina. Um, commercially, in places like California, um, with Earthrise Nutraceuticals and, and places, uh, a few other places around the world, they do. Uh, they have a larger scale of production, right? Which is these kind of commercial raceway ponds. And what it looks like is, um, you know, if, you, if we zoom in a little bit on this, then it's a concrete line. Um, it's a big concrete line pond with this kind of concrete barrier in the middle. And the reason why it's called a raceway is there's some paddle wheels and basically the water just goes in a big raceway circle around and around, and that's how they try to get some mixing. Okay. So that's, but you can see that now these ponds, because it's a plant, it's a plant that grows uh, floating in water, right? That's why it was found in lakes, and it grew on the top of old lakes, right? And originally it was found in the ocean, but it's evolved into a freshwater, there are freshwater streams as well as saltwater streams as far as we know. But like all algae, it grows, it's microalgae, it grows by floating in the water, but it needs sunlight. And so if you try to have too much depth of water in a pond or a lake or something like this, right, then the algae will only grow on the top level because you have what's called photo inhibition, which means they get so thick that they'll block light from getting to the algae below it unless you can get really good mixing, right? So normally in a kind of a pond like this, you can only have a depth of maybe 20 to 30 centimeters. If you have more than that, you don't grow, so they don't make the pond any deeper than that, right? Which means to grow a lot of it, you, need, you still need to take a lot of space. Now, you don't need arable land, right? So they, can, they typically use space in arid environments, right? Kind of desert areas or semi uh, kind of desert areas. But still, uh, you know, it becomes a bit space intensive uh, to, do it, uh, to do it that way. What is the suggestion? Uh, this one I think is, um, let's see, this one may not be Earthrise. This one might be one in uh, Hawaii. It says Hawaii. Yeah. Yeah, no problem. So I think that would be, uh, I forget which company it was. But now what we do, right, we're trying to change the game a bit. And we want to make a fresh product available. And so we want to be able to produce it locally. So we're looking at urban farming as a way to do that, right? So where do you have space? Obviously on rooftops. What we've got is a closed system design of bioreactors that we leveraged from the oyster industry, where they grow other forms of saltwater algae, and they feed it to the oysters in that uh, they grow in tanks, right? Because oysters like to eat algae in their, their filter feeders. 
So we leveraged the design of that. We turned it into, uh, instead of just individual uh, systems, we interlink them, which makes it easier to automate stuff, right? We have automated harvesting, automated uh, mixing for nutrients, these types of things, right? And we use a system like this. This is the rooftop of the Nova Tel CM Square in downtown Bangkok, right next to CM Paragon. We grow on 130 square meters in their roof. We have a commercial production facility. Our R&D center and food processing center is on the here. 130 square meters of their rooftop. We produce uh, more than between 80 and 100 kilos of spirulina every week. We harvest three times a week, Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We actually harvest overnight, the night before. We pick it up on Mondays because we have an automated harvesting system. Right, that with a timer, it turns it on at around 1 a.m. and or 2, 3 a.m. turns it off around 5, 6, 7 a.m. So we take some of the spirulina out. This is this is a large kind of bags full of water, if you will, right? And we we can because we have really good mixing, we can have a, a height of 0.9 to 1 meter, 1.2 meters, right? So what happens is we can now use get more volume on a certain amount of space. Now, but, but think about those numbers for a second, right? We produce 80 to 100 kilos of food grade, highly nutritious stuff every week on 130 square meters. I mean, if you had a tomato garden up there, you wouldn't laugh at an eyelash at coming in anywhere near as close to producing 100 kilos a week of tomatoes on 130 square meters. Beef, not a chance. You know, Soy, never. Corn, uh-uh. And we don't need soda. You know, we we recycle the water. Well, I mean, we have very little evaporative loss. And once you put water in, it just continues to grow. We add nutrients with every harvest, right? So why, why is it covered? Uh, well, we don't have to cover it. Most open ponds are open because it grows in a highly basic solution. Um, it kind of naturally prevents contamination. We cover it because of the high ratings here and everything else. We just wanted to have a covered design so that we present, prevent like large amounts of water coming in and overflowing the system, for example, stuff like this. Well, we use airlift pumps. So what's happening is, and I've got some videos and stuff later I can show people, but we have an interlink system. We have an air compressor with a filter on it, or air blower rather, and we, it doesn't take a lot because of, uh, you're using gravity with the weight of the water column to help a lot. You just use a little bit of air to assist. So we push a little bit of air in, and you have an airlift geyser pump, as it's called. And it causes water to go from the bottom of one into the top of another. We, just, we, make a, we call it a closed circuit, because we link 20 of these bioreactors at about 200 liters each together. So we have about four tons of water all in one system. And it's just kind of flowing around itself with a little bit of energy that's used for an air compressor. But we use the air compressor because we want to add CO2 from the air as well, you know, so it helps uh, because we need to, to have that for its growth. So, you know, if you look at, um, at what we do, we're trying to, our mission statement is, is basically to su supply cities, right, with a highly sustainable, nutritious source of food. And so, you know, <coughs> What we have, as I mentioned, is again, this is another view of the Novotel CM Square before we kind of filled in this area. This picture was taken several months ago, right? Just looking out at downtown Bangkok. We've got our, our production up here to, to accomplish that. And we're just, you know, in the process of uh, acquiring more rooftop space to grow. And we do it sustainably, not just from an environmental perspective, right? Because to be a sustainable enterprise, I, you know, I feel like you need to be sustainable on all levels including financially, right? The whole mantra of, of, of uh, what's it, PPP, right? People plan and profit, right? So we don't ask for any handouts from the Novotel. We pay them rent for the rooftop space. We pay for all of our utilities. We have separate meters. And they like it so much, you know, they get free publicity, right? They, they've gotten a lot of, there was a, a thing in the Tire Ways in Flight Magazine about the Novotel and our project there. There's a, been a, a bunch of web-based articles. There was a program on uh, a TNN, Thai News Network, called I Like TV. They did a feature where they interviewed the resident manager of the Novotel about this 
uh, process, tried some product, went up to the rooftop, took pictures of everything, uh, filmed it, you know, and had it on uh, broadcast on TV. And now the Novatel made a uh, five-minute video, which they put up on YouTube about that program, right? They get all that, all that benefit, you know. But we keep the product that we produce and we sell it. And in fact, the Novatel, both the staff, because they employ 500 people, they all love our product. We have loads of people in the Novatel who buy Spiraland from us. Now it's on their buffet, in, in the, the buffet for their residents. They've had residents ask to buy spirulina from them, so we're going to start selling them on consignment in their shop, right? So it's kind of a win-win relationship, right? Nice little symbiotic system. Uh, yeah. Since you mentioned entrepreneurial you know, endeavors, do you have these as home units? Could you... No, I, I, get, I get asked that, and, and here's the thing, right? Yeah, you, you look at one bioreactor, it basically can produce, uh, you know, roughly in the right environment, it's about a kilo, 0.8 to 1 kilo per square meter of bioreactor <coughs> per week, right? So if you wanted to have a kilo of spirulina for yourself, you have one or two of these bioreactors. The problem is, like, we have years of R&D and four microbiologists on staff, right? You know, I mean, it sounds nice, and I make it sound easy, you know, and it's not rocket science, and I say that as a degree aerospace engineer, right? But it's also not necessarily cut out for, you know, it's not a home gardening kind of thing, right? It's not cut out for the lane. There's a lot of frustration that can be involved if you don't have a lot of experience with it and know what you're doing, right? So, yeah, we get asked that sometimes. It's just not something, you know, we're kind of ready to support yet. Maybe someday we'll have kids that include nutrient kits and stuff, but, but not yet. So today we're in Bangkok. Um, we are looking to, to move beyond uh, beyond Bangkok down the road. We've got a lot of opportunity now in Thailand from a rooftop area perspective, right? So no need to move uh, in the immediate term. But I think down the road we would look to expand to other cities to try to make a difference. You know, kind of initially focusing on um, you know tropical environments, and then also to other places where you've got non-arable land in large volumes. Like or large quantities like sub Saharan Africa, et cetera, produce. So, so that's, uh, that's my talk. Um, I do have lots of additional content I can share. Uh, hope you guys enjoyed a bit, learning a bit about spirulina and what we do. It was my first time using Prezi in a presentation. I thought it was kind of neat. Um, I don't know if many of you are familiar with Prezi, but uh, it's freeware, it's web based. Um, make presentations and, and do this kind of stuff where it goes in and out and all this. It's kind of neat. Um, I first saw the Better World Book guy, uh, Better World Books, you, you know him? Uh, one of their co-founders, their social enterprise based out of the U.S. I saw them do a presentation using this software. I thought it was pretty neat a few years ago. So, Anyway, uh, any questions? I, I see you guys all got your, your spiraling smoothies. Some were a bit very and in trying it, some were a bit more cautious. Um, let me tell you a bit about this, right? Let me tell you what's in there. Only stuff that's in there is, is the fruit that they were serving here. So there's some papaya, watermelon, and um, pineapple. Bit of ice, bit of uh, water, and some spirulina, right? And what we like to tell people is, now, some people who are familiar with spirulina know the taste, right? Either a taste that is uh, kind of seaweedy or a taste that's kind of wheatgrassy. But we got kind of lucky, right? The local strains of spirulina that grow here in Thailand and that we grow, uh, we, we have gotten and, and that's what we grow here, um, they don't really have a strong taste. They're fairly taste neutral, right? So that, what that means is when you mix it with something else, you pretty much just forget the taste of something else. And we've done this lots of times and at all the organic markets around town. We have fun showing people this, right? You mix it with hummus, it still tastes like hummus. It's just really green. You mix it with peanut butter, it still tastes just like peanut butter. It's a little bit creamier and it's, it's light green. It turns that brown into light green. Now, the only thing we found that it doesn't turn green is beetroot, which it turns like something in between purple and green, you know? So, but not brown. It's something like dark purple. <coughs> I don't know. But most everything else, it turns green. Um, but it doesn't taste very strong. 
And so the reason why when people ask me is I like to say spirally that the, you know, the species that you find around the world, they're kind of like grapes, right? If you think from a wine perspective. They all kind of have their own unique flavors and aromas. And the Thai one that we grow, we just happen to have one that is fairly taste neutral. So what I hope that you may have noticed when you tasted this, right, is for the most part, not very much of a taste of the actual spirulina, but mostly just the taste of the fruit that's in the smoothie. How much did you put in one cup? Well, I made a, a pitcher, um, so which was basically one and a half blend, or well, basically one blender is loaded, and I just put 100 grams uh, in there. I brought a couple of hundred grams, and I mixed it into the stuff that you guys you guys had. You make the pitcher in the morning, and I only drink two cups. How long will it uh, can I keep it for a day? The pitcher? Um, yeah, I would say in the fridge, you know, probably for a few days. Um, but I, what I would suggest, and what I do myself, is I just make a smoothie. I make a smaller amount of a smoothie, but I make it for myself and my partner. We have a we share we have a smoothie in the morning, so we make you know basically two big glasses, and that's part of our breakfast. You know, you mix in whatever you want, fruit to taste, or sometimes you mix it with peanut butter and just spread it on something or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, so do you guys remember a restaurant that uh, another social entrepreneur started called Dine in the Dark? Yes, yeah. so, no, Julian? Yeah. So we did a couple of events with Julian at Dine in the Dark. One was for World Environment Day, and the other was, um, uh, I think it was for Earth Day. Um, and uh, oh, some the same, they're actually on different days. I think it was in April, one's in April each year. And uh, he had welcome drinks, right, when you, before you go into the dark area. And uh, he had the uh, alcoholic and non-alcoholic person, and the alcoholic person just said, well, I can no, no real issue. Some people, if you do some research online, they say spiraling is good for not really mixing with alcohol, but as a hangover remedy. <laughs> <laughs> we have some people who buy it for that. I don't drink that much myself, personally. Uh, I think you had a question, and there's two questions over there. So. Oh, OK. okay. okay. Pollution thing. How, how do you go around that growing, um, sure. growing rooftop and making things Well, there's a couple of things, and, and as uh, the one gentleman asked about, you know, we have these covers, right? And as I mentioned, we we blow in air, and we have two stages of filtration on the air that goes into the blower that then goes through here. So each system, one of the reasons this bag looks so, this bag hat, as we call it, the top looks so tight. This is not, this is two pieces, one on the bottom, one on the top, is the system's under positive pressure because we're blowing air in. So air from outside can't get in except through the filtration of the air blower. Air can only go out, right? So you won't get stuff coming in. But even if you didn't have that, you know, I mean, firstly, you know, as bad as it may seem, Air quality levels in Bangkok are comparable to Chicago, right? They're not like Beijing. So the air here is not that bad, person. Secondly, this is on the 27th floor. So you've got some, you know, the ground level air pollution that you might see and feel every day, not the same when you, you know, it's a bit less when you get up at that altitude. Third, thirdly, right? Spirulina, like all plants that are using the environmental air, right? They, they're made for things like this. Spirulina is uh, known as a chelator of things, right? Just like uh, uh, chlor um, chlorella as well, right? What does that mean? Well, species like spirulina, what they do, uh, algae, is they can take some, some contaminants, like heavy metals like mercury, and they can chelate it, which means they can trap it and make it inert. So if one consumes spirulina, or if, if it uptakes mercury, for example, and makes it in a way where if you consume it, you, you won't get it, right? In fact, chlorophyll and spirulina are often used, or they used to be used, uh, as natural ways to uh, help relieve mercury poisoning from people. They would just give you massive doses of these types of algae, and they would naturally kind of remove the mercury from your body. Okay, So, you know, you could, obviously nobody wants to get mercury in, intake from any food source, the straight answer is that's one of the reasons why we have a closed system, positive pressure. But even if it was open on the top, it's, it, it's not really an issue. Uh, I was just curious, um, 
you said you cover 130 square meters. Uh, how many years for you to to have covered for? Well, on if you look at just the variable costs, right? So, like, if you look at the rent we pay, the electricity we pay, the nutrients, the materials, the system itself on 130 square meters can be can be profitable, right? The thing is, at the moment, we have a lot of base costs because we have an R&D center, we have microbiologists on staff, etc. So we, as a company, are not profitable yet. We anticipate being break-even either by the end of this year or early next year. The real limiter for us at the moment is two limiters. One is we're looking for additional rooftop space to grow on. It's, it's surprisingly difficult to find, uh, believe it or not, even though it's not used for that much. It's just getting owners of buildings comfortable uh, or even just getting to them in general, right? Getting to the point where you reach a contact who's a decision maker, and sometimes there's multiple decision makers, takes several months. So we're in pretty far along with a couple of other site locations right now, which will take us several months to then scale up. One is uh, one is about 400 and something square meters. The other is uh, 250 to 300 square meters. So hopefully, as those two, you know, start to come online in the next couple of months and we scale up there, then we'll have enough production. And from those, we should be able to, to get close, if not pass, very deep. Um, but yeah, just from a self-contained, if you only look at cost of sales, cost of production, even a facility like this can be profitable, actually, more than very deep. Uh, the, the weight of the, I mean, there's a lot of water there. So is there a, do you sort of make some calculations on how much the roof can take? We do, we do. And we actually have that dialogue with building as well, and sometimes we even bring in structural engineers. The great thing about places like Thailand and, and Southeast Asia is you have flat concrete roofs that are designed to be fairly low bearing. So, you know, I mean, this is, you know, two, oops, uh, this is 200 liters of water spread out on roughly a square meter. So, you know, typically the roofs here can handle more than 200 kg per square meter. They're usually designed for four or five hundred. Just, just a quick question. You talked about the shelf life being just about a good four weeks. Like, how, how do you scale up? Like, are you able to like ship this overseas or anything? Or this gonna we actually sell it with? we actually have a lot of interest right now, and from some uh, possible overseas uh, clients, one in the UK. Um, in particular, we had one fellow in Estonia who was interested in one in Australia. So we're looking into that at the, at, at the moment. Um, there's a few fresh produce exporters from Thailand who cater to the European market. They tend to use air freight, and they get it there, um, you know, basically in one day's time. So if you have a three to four week shelf life, that's okay. You know, long term plan would be to have more local production still. Now, you know, in climates like Europe, we wouldn't necessarily produce there, but our, our thought process is that in uh, northern and sub-Saharan Africa, we would produce for the European market. In Mexico, we would produce for the North American market. Is there any FDA requirement when it comes to the US? Yeah, and that's actually, so that's why I mentioned we have interested parties, and one of the things that we're working through right now is all of that paperwork and everything to get uh, the FDA certifications and the export licenses and health certificates. And we've done all the lab testing. We know already that our product is going great. It's just a matter of filing the right paperwork. And because there's not a lot of awareness, there's a lot of iteration that has to happen because it's, you know most people like you know don't know necessarily on the working level of these organizations like where what category classification spiraling goes into. Like in the UK, we finally just found it. You know what the code is for fresh algae uh, algae product. You know stuff like this, right? They you said you sell it, you offer the two uh, configurations, one is the paste, and the other one is powder. We do offer powder, it's more than you then uh, classify it separately. They have two classifications for it, that's right. Two codes. Even the US, the US FDA has, like if you go on their, uh, the website of the USDA, for example, they have both a fresh and a dry spire thing on it. The nutrition benefits are the same. Um, well, it's dry powder is more concentrated, so because you've had you've taken the water out, so in an equivalent mass, you get a lot more nutritional value from powder. You just don't need to take as much, right? Do you, do you lose anything? 
Yeah, I mean, arguably you do, right? Like, uh, especially it depends on the drying process. I mean, you need to make sure you dry it at below 60 degrees Celsius so you don't need any your proteins or vitamins. Even then, you know, it's like the difference between eating a tomato and a powdered tomato. You know, I mean, you're probably going to lose a little bit in the processing. Yeah. Do you have plans to, to move to, to you know, concentrate the form? Well, you know, again, we, we do have, uh, we, we do produce powder. And, and the nice thing is actually, what we do is, so the shelf life of a spirulina powder is one to four years, you know, depending on storage. So we use it as kind of a, when we have excess product, because we don't have enough demand to sell the 100 kilos that we produce every week, we turn it into powder, right? If we have uh, excess demand, then we can sell powder, right? So it becomes kind of our buffer. And the other nice thing is, at the moment, as we raise awareness with partner groups that are carrying our product, right, what we offer to them is we stock refrigerators at places like Aspire Gym and a few others, uh, locations around town, RA Wellness in, in the Q uh, House building by Lumpini and Radiant Soul Foods. And, you know, if after, you know, one and a half or two weeks they haven't sold that particular product, we take it back and give them fresh products as we harvest three times a week. And we turn the product that we take back, which is still good, we just dry it into powder for a long term uh, kind of demand usage. On that note, uh, where are your, your sales mostly through retail outlets, or, or do you also sell directly online? We, we don't sell directly yet. We are thinking about having an online portal, but we don't necessarily want to compete that much with our retailers. I mean, ultimately, what we want to do is we don't want to be in the retail business, right? We want to be in the wholesale production business, and we want to expand production to make kind of the, the impact and let retailers retail, right? And then make their, their normal profits or whatever. So uh, we're just kind of retailing, but now to help grow awareness. And ultimately, what we're finding is what, what we're trying to get to in the next stage is making products that are enriched with spirulina. So for example, we're looking at some R&D with companies that make, uh, one is a snack producer that's sold in 7-Eleven, a fish snack thing. They kind of came to us. The other is a, a noodle maker. Uh, I don't know, have you guys, are any of you familiar with Shabutan, the, the chain that Central Group owns? They have one in some of the Centrals and uh, Central, Central World, stuff like that. So they have a spirulina ramen uh, dish that's on their menu. It was a special for a while, and now it's a permanent item. They have a factory in Thailand that makes the spirulina ramen for them, and they asked us to talk to that company because they currently import the spirulina that they use. So we've talked to them. They don't use a lot of spirulina in their recipe, but we have the idea of what we'd like to do is make like spirulina and rich spaghetti using a pretty decent amount of spirulina, maybe 5 to 10, 15 percent, so that um, you really get a lot of nutritional value, and then have it as a export product for the Western markets, because then since it's a finished good, it has a much longer shelf life as well, um, but you still get a lot of nutritional value, and it would be an awareness builder, right? Because people are already used to some green spaghetti and stuff like this, or even colored spaghetti and whatever, and there's just such a large consumer base that if you get people to start to eat it and know what it is, feel comfortable with it, and eventually they might also buy it in raw form. Right now it's hard to get people over the inertia. I mean, you know, it looks green. It looks different, you know, than what people are used to. And not everybody can get over that and taste it. Once they do taste it and they start to have it, we have pretty much a lot of repeat business. We, we get a lot of repeat consumers, but the initial kind of push takes some time. And you're making any clothing over like you know, people ask that question. We have one guy uh, who's a fitness guy yeah. who, at some times, he takes 300 grams in a day um, of our of our base product. But you know, what will happen is naturally, like you won't you won't on it, you know, because it's filling. So like you just eat less of other stuff, you know. It, and nothing in there. It's not like a vitamin tablet. So especially in base form, there's nothing that's already 200 percent of a daily recommended allowance. So if you take you know, five times and almost serving you get a thousand percent or whatever. Everything is, you know, a reasonable percentage of an RDA. So if you took a very, very large amount, you would fill yourself up before you ever came close to ODing on any particular subject. Right? Yeah, except if it's on the powder. Uh, 
form. Then mm. uh, you just like mix it like raw powder with your yeah, honey maybe. juice. And this that, little, uh, that that could be true, but but I think firstly you should follow the recommendation of three to ten yeah, grams, yeah. right? Obviously. Yeah. But uh, yeah, if you maybe if you ate a kilo of powder all at once, I'm not quite sure how you would. It's quite you know it's powder, right? It's chalky. It's like you know I don't know how you do it, but yeah, maybe then in that case, but it would take a lot of effort. Though. Um, the of, uh, nowadays, it's, uh, oh, sorry, Lena. Well, as I mentioned, it depends on the figure that you believe. It's somewhere total algae production is somewhere between twenty thousand and sixty thousand tons per year. Now, of spirulina, like okay, the biggest producer, the biggest producer countries of spirulina are China, uh, India, Thailand, believe it or not, and the USA. China, Thailand, the largest producer of spirulina produces three tons of dry powder per year. Not that much. So I think actually a lot of the world algae production of these so many thousands of tons, actually the figure includes seaweed, because it's a macroalgae. And so you've got those figures as well. Global spirulina production today, if you ask my opinion, is actually only more like, uh, I don't know, maybe a thousand tons max. Two thousand tons. No, because the costs are high, right? If you're going to use a big open pond system or whatever, you know, you've got you've got a lot of barriers to entry for large scale. No, nobody. There's not not really any player that's a large scale producer. You know, maybe some folks in China, but even then, you know, you have to be a bit cautious, right? Because what I understand is, you know, uh, well, anyway, there's you remember milk and melanie. Remember that whole thing? Yeah, so, so, yeah. so apparently you can take, did, did, did you guys know that bird feathers are about 70% protein? Chicken feathers and that stuff? So if you powder feathers and you dye them green, and they look like other green powder. That's all I'm saying. So, you know, be careful as a consumer what you get. But again, uh, this is actually reports from that we have heard. Because nobody does QC to the extent of looking under a microscope for every batch of stuff that's produced, right? So you have to be cautious of your supply. But, you know, um, in general, in the West, of trustworthy suppliers, there's not that much competition right now. A good one is Perry's Nutraceutical out of India. They actually produce organic spirulina. They're, they're quite well known. They export to the UK, they export to Europe. The problem with their stuff is because I think of some of their organic processes, their price is very good, but consistently it has a very wheat grassy kind of strong flavor that's not palatable to most people. And so I think that limits their total demand. What's the most capital aspect of Yeah, I mean, it's the RD side. Once you get past that, you know, then, then it can be. Oh, so for, for regular production, the, for operating costs, it's nutrients. So, like, okay, King Monka University in Tonbury, right? They have a microbiology department that's been working with spirulina in particular for more than 20 years. Chula uh, works, you know, the Chula, Chula Engineering Center is here, uh, Dr. Prasert in particular over there. And he works with some other strains about the saltwater strains and stuff. The ones that focus on uh, spirulina are Kessert and King Monka Tonbury. They've been working with it for 20 years. And according to their figures over time, they've never been able to commercialize it because, except for Green Diamond, which is based out of uh, Boonsong Farms, which is based out of Chiang Chiang Mai, who's an ex UTT professor, and they're the ones who produce three tons of powder per year. They're the only, com they're the big commercial producer as far as they know, uh, in Thailand other than us. They've been around for a while. Um, Kating UTT says, you know, 60 something percent of your operating cost is your bicarbonate, your carbon source. And, and that's like several hundred bucks. So, you know, per kilo. So, like, if you have that kind of cost, it's difficult to overcome it, you know, commercially in their minds on large scale. Could you speak a little bit about the whole of the brand, the ends of jars, in what it looks like in the commodity market? Mm. Uh, so, yeah, it's interesting. We, we're trying to develop a brand. So, our company, right, Energaia, doesn't sound like a food product or a food producing company, right? 
So we did a lot of, of work of trying to brainstorm ideas with consumers, uh, surveys at farmers markets and stuff like this. And let me see if I can find that other picture as we do ours. Um, yeah, here we go. And kind of what we we used to just label a jar with our company name, Energaia, and we, we kind of have changed to this, which we had a friend who's kind of a social-minded designer who we paid him to, to do it. And, and my, my firm opinion is, I mean, if you think about it, right, think about brands globally. You can have a brand that's had a type to a particular product, or you can have a brand name that doesn't mean anything, and you refuse a lot of information to it, or you find some brand names that are location-based, right, like Kobe B, you know, Wagyu B, stuff like that. I have brands that are, don't really mean a whole lot or don't have inherent food-based meaning or things like Coke, right? Coca-Cola, you know, I agree with because they could just put cocaine in it originally. But, uh, um, you know, Gatorade, which is really because of the University of Florida, Florida Gators, or something like this, right? I think brands like that. Pepsi, what's Pepsi? I'm not thinking that. Or you've got a brand that's, you know, based on what it is. Like we called it Spy Rule or something like that. We looked at names like this, right? We ended up trying to look at the location base because if you think about marketing, right, uh, and, you, and you hear people talk about selling things, really, the way you really impact the consumer is if you can get them emotionally to tie into some part of your message. So if you can tell a good story that links, it doesn't have to be, you know, uh, tear-jerking emotions. It can just be some kind of empathetic reaction, right? And they're enjoying your story or what have you, or, have you or, or some form of empathy with the story. And that be, tends to be more memorable and therefore better in long term marketing. So we decided to go with the location based nomenclature of Skyline and Spiralina because then we can tell the story of how we produce it on rooftops, right? We're urban farmers, which, you know, we think is, is really important and it's pretty cool, right? And most people who hear our story think that it's pretty cool because you know, who else is doing this, right? Nobody. Nobody for microbiology. I mean, you've got a few folks growing some herbs and vegetables on a few rooftops here and there, but it's not commercial. You know, that's a hobby, with, right? So we're really one of the only commercial urban farmers around, and that's a pretty interesting story, you know. And, and we wanted to highlight that in our in our brand. Does that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Well, you know what's funny is um, one of the ways we've gotten the shelf life up to three to four weeks is um, it, like normally the only other commercial producer that I know of that sells paste, and I don't even know who they are, but from other people around the world who've asked us, uh, sent us inquiries, they said the shelf life was only three days, right? Because they don't normally sell it, they, sell, they turn it into powder, so they have an optimized production, right? Um, geared around producing a paste. The way we've gotten it up to three to four weeks is a few different ways. We started off with a product that was only good for about a week on the shelf, and then two weeks, not three to four weeks. We haven't added any preservatives. But what we've done is, spirulina grows in a basic, slightly saline environment. So the more you can keep it, uh, like anything else, the more you can keep it fresh and alive for longer, the longer its shelf life will be. So one thing that can cause the cells, because they're very soft, to break apart, which obviously kills it, is if you take spirulina, which out of this kind of very basic environment, and when you do the rinse, because you need to rinse it before you then package it, right? Um, you need to rinse it, and then you need to take water out of it. Those are the two key steps of processing it. If you rinse it in just fresh water, then osmotic pressure, right? The difference in basically, um, uh, uh, ions, ion-based pressure, right? Uh, it's a chemical pressure that'll rupture the cell walls. But if you rinse it in the saline water, slightly like normal saline, two, three, four percent salt water, then it doesn't cause that huge strain and stress on the cell walls. So it keeps the cell walls more intact. And we did all this testing with different salinities, looking under microscopes, refrigerating it, taking it back out, looking under microscopes, trying to regrow it again. Uh, so if you do that. And then we used to, the way most people around the world simplistically take the water out after you rinse it, is they use manual presses, right? Uh, there's some, you know, if they're small scales and they just squeeze it themselves, if they're slightly bigger scale or, and they're in the, you know, the, the poor kind of World Health Organization type 
things that I showed you, that they make a little wooden plate thing with a stick on it and they press it that way, right? And if they're a bit fancier, like in uh, France, they grow a lot of spirulina in small communities for community consumption. You can find videos on YouTube about that. Um, then they use uh, what looks like a big kind of spaghetti strainer thing that's a metal contraption. And they put spirulina in there, they use this big metal kind of press to press water out, right? But what we did, thinking about this problem from an engineering perspective, you know, the most expensive way to do it, that what, which is what university labs do for very small amounts of spirulina, right? Nothing ever commercially viable, is they use a centrifuge. Because you take water out with very even pressure, very light, very easy on the cells, it doesn't damage them, right? So we were having a management meeting, we were talking with somebody who's not really that much of an engineer, and we were like, talking like, yeah, you know, if we get the centrifuging, that would be better. And they're like, centrifuge, what's that? Is that kind of like a washing machine? And they're like, hmm. <laughs> so we, took, we bought a brand new Samsung washing machine. We tore it apart, changed the controls to what we wanted, made it more robust, never washed a single set of clothes in there, never put any soap in there. And now we've got two of them. We use it as a, we, we have a liner, a cloth liner. We do a saline rinse, we put it in there. We use it as a low, a low cost centrifuge because you don't need all the speed of a main centrifuge. You don't need to get up to thousands of RPM. It's overkill. You only need to get up to a few hundred RPM. And that takes the water out so evenly that it looks like a silky kind of paste afterwards. So when you have a very uniform food product that's not got you know manual pressed little pockets of water stuck in your product when you do large scale because it's evenly dewatered and you don't have all that osmotic pressure, now we've got the shelf life up to three to four weeks. And what that means is even after two or three weeks of it being in the fridge, when you take it out. If you, sorry for the long answer to your question, but I find it quite interesting. So uh, you can put it back in the water that it uses to grow in, which is water with some nutrients in it that make it a little bit basic, and it will regrow. Now don't worry, it won't grow in you, because remember I talked about stomach acid? <laughs> 2 to 4 pH, this thing likes to grow in 8 to 10 pH, your stomach acid just kills it as soon as it goes in there. Right? But that's how you get the shelf life of three to four weeks, because it's basically still kind of a living vegetable in your refrigerator for the first two, three weeks. Yeah, uh, yeah so the closed circuit uh, production, great idea. How much power does that take? Or you guys have yeah, it's not much like, a, it's, um, you know, we have a bigger sized air blower than we need at Novotel because we weren't sure at first, since this is our first larger scale site, what, what size we need. And we use, you know, a few kilowatt hours. So like, our total electricity bill at you know the high price that they charge is kind of the commercial price of five baht a unit uh, in a given month is like I don't know seven thousand baht or something like that. Yeah. And and we we wouldn't even need to use that much if we just got a smaller blower, but we have we haven't done that yet. You know because we don't have a place to put the bigger blower, so we might as well just use it. Right. My next question is how would it be uh, a marketing standpoint a total sustainable? You know, having that $7,000 having sustainable means to... Yeah, you mean like if you got... Yeah, totally sustainable energy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sure. Well, I mean, the, on rooftops you can't put a wind turbine. And if I put solar there, then we're actually... Spirulina as a three and a half billion year old organism is a more efficient energy utilizer than a solar panel. So if we use the rooftop space for a solar panel, the panel blower, that's rooftop space we could have used to put a bioreactor to grow spirulina. So we're better off just putting the spirulina bioreactor there, right? <clears throat> now if we can figure out, you know, if we can use some solar panels that you put on the sidewalls or something like that of the building or something to power it, then eventually, yeah. Mm -hmm. But, right. Can you potentially use the, you know, the heat recovery system from the air from that kind of stuff and you kind of have an extension to kind of feed the system? You know, so what we're going to do at uh, facilities outside of Megapark, we have we have a couple lined up already, but we're this, these pictures I've showed you of our design are our Gen 1 design. And for those of you guys coming to our tour of our facility on um, on Monday at our R&D Center in Unna, you'll see our Gen 2 design and stuff like this. One suite, which is a little bit easier to put up in large scale and maintain. Um, so we, we've still kind of been doing R&D to refine our, our system design. Um, we already have some sites lined up where eventually we'll have 10,000 of these reactors on land that's not used for anything else, not farmlands, land next to uh, tapioca mill, right? 
And because we can, you know, because of the nature of the system, we can have it kind of hodgepodge in any configuration we want. It doesn't have to be a perfect rectangular or a square track, right? So we can use land that people have available that they're not using or able to use for anything else, right? At that kind of facility, they take, uh, you know, they have big ponds that they use to produce biogas, and then burn in the gas engine to produce steam electricity for the mill. And the gas is very clean, you know, because they use clean biogas to produce it. There's no toxins, it's not coal or anything like that, right? It's from an organic star product, tapioca. But anyway, we will tap into their flue gas source throughout the temperature. It's more uh, concentrated carbon dioxide, so it helps us because we need, we can use more concentrated carbon dioxide than just what's in the air. And we'll push that into our bag system. But on the rooftop of most buildings here, they don't have a carbon source or, or they don't have necessarily the kind of thing you're talking about. Like the vent exhaust for this place, this, this thing, we looked at it, it's not even really a vent exhaust with any pressure. I think this is a remnant. Most of this stuff, they, they exhaust on floors below the roof. So, like the kitchen exhaust and everything is on the floors, several floors below the roof. So there was nothing up here that we could really utilize. Even these satellite dishes are remnants. They don't, they don't do anything. They're just too costly to carve up and take down, remove, so they just leave them open. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you for your time. And I uh, hope this was uh, a bit interesting. If you have any other questions, we'll please let me know. Well, what do you get on the Well, we have um, one, of, one of the, one place is uh, Radiant Whole Foods. They have an online delivery thing where they deliver every week. One is uh, Ray Tom Organic Farms. They do a CSA lunchbox kind of thing where they deliver every week. Um, then there's a few shops, like uh, right under a soap BTS is Aspire Fitness. And they usually have jars in their fridge, which is on the ground floor. You can just go in and purchase. Uh, and then there's a... Uh, uh, Aspire. Uh, A-S-P-I-R-E. If you go to our website, if you go to our website, we've got a list of all the places where you can buy. So I'd like to thank Sanon very much for this wonderful talk. And now I'm very excited to go out and, and buy um, Skyline from uh, one of his retailers. And um, we're very lucky to have arranged with him a, a visit to the on the uh, facilities on Monday. So you haven't signed up. There's still some places left. Um, we have 18 people signed up right now. It's, it's at Ondo, so you just take the BTS. And we meet there on the second floor, right, of the Honda um, Honda, is it a showroom or? Yeah, we have floors two through the rooftop, so two, three, four, and the roof. Uh, we just need a ground floor. And we enter from the front, or? Yeah, we'll, okay. we'll have some signs and stuff. Great. Yeah, and all the information that you've been asking about will be on our website as well as, um, you know, being able to see it on mdiar.com. So, without further ado, I'd like to thank Sean Michelle for a certificate of appreciation. So yes, so um, we will be making an announcement of the uh, the second talk for May very soon. Um, that will be on the Bangladeshi uh, factory collapse on the 30th of May. And um, we are trying to get the speaker for June, but it will probably be on energy efficiency. Very interesting guy, and we'll confirm that soon. And hope to see you on Monday at the MAI uh, R&D office. Thank you very much.